I'm going to um, introduce Pi in a way that uh, I don't think many people will have seen before. A friend of mine, David Tong, told me about this and I think it's really neat. And it involves uh, rolling balls at each other. Uh, our thought experiment involves just two balls. So there's a small ball and we'll give it a, a mass little m. And there's a big ball and we'll give this mass a big m. This is actually a 10-pin bowling ball which I believe you stole. Now the idea is that uh, this ball, the big ball, is rolling with some initial velocity and it hits the little ball. Now the little ball moves off and hits the uh, wall and it bounces elastically. That means that when it bounces it doesn't lose any uh, kinetic energy or any momentum. It bounces back. Meanwhile the big ball is carrying on it hits the big ball again, and then of course it bounces back. The big ball, is, it's imparted a little bit of momentum to the big ball, which, which is now slowing down. It goes back, bounces again, comes back, bounces back, goes back, and just keeps doing this. Eventually, the big ball slows down enough that it stops, and that the next collision will begin to go back. Okay, so the, the system is the ball's coming in, there's a number of collisions, and then the big ball eventually bounces and goes back. And what's that got to do with pi? The question is, how many collisions are there between the big ball and the little ball before the big ball starts going the other way? Okay? It's as simple as that. Now, as long as the mass of this big ball is quite particular, in, in fact, it's given as in terms of the little mass, it's given as 16 times 100 to the power n, where I'm going to let this number n vary. So if n is 0, the big ball is 16 times the mass of the little ball. If n is 1, the big ball is 16, uh, 1,600 times the mass of the little ball. If n is 2, the, the mass is 160,000 times that of the little ball. So as long as you've got this very particular mass, then it turns out that the number of collisions between the big ball and the little ball is the first n plus 1 digits of pi. So if n equals 0, then the number of, so the ball, big ball is 16 times the mass of the little ball, there'll be three collisions. If n is 1, so the big ball is 1600 times that of the little ball, and so there will be 31 collisions. If n is 3, there'll be 314 collisions. If n is 4, there'll be 3,141 collisions. What's remarkable about this, I think, is that this is exact. As long as n is an integer that just can, and you let it get bigger and bigger and bigger, you will get exactly the number of, the relevant number of digits of pi. So, if this was 3 grams, which, and this is about 4.8 kilograms, then there would be of order uh, 31 collisions. So if, so if I scale this up so that this was a boulder of mass 480 kilograms, then there should be 314 collisions before the boulder begins to go backwards. I guess these things are round and have circumferences and pi, so is that where this is all coming from? It's got nothing to do with that, which is fantastic. In fact, if this was a point object with a very massive, and that was a point object, it would, the same thing would still apply. The, the, the fact that it's round has nothing to do with it. What is important is that the collision is elastic, that it conserves energy and conserves momentum, but it could be any shaped object that would do that. So this has nothing to do with circles? This has nothing at all to do with the circle of this ball and the circle of this ball. So if that was a cube or something else? I think, yes, that would, be, that would still work. As long as we're in the collision, you conserved energy and momentum. All right, now you're going to have to explain it. Okay. Okay, here we go. Let's try and make sense of a, a two balls hitting each other and how we get pi out of it. Let's just draw it again. Um, so the idea is I have some surface and then I have some wall at the end and I have a little ball of mass little m and a, a big ball 
of mass, big M. And initially, the big ball is moving with some velocity. Let's call it U. And it hits the little ball. And then what happens is the little ball begins to go towards the wall. Meanwhile, the big ball carries on. The big ball is still moving. The little ball hits the wall and comes back. And then it hits the big ball again. And so the little ball bounces back, hits the, this wall, bounces back. I mean, each time the little ball hits the big ball, it transfers a bit of its momentum over to the big ball, and the big ball will slow down. And it, in fact, eventually the big ball will stop and will begin to go the other way. And what we want to know is if, if that happens um, after, say, p steps, then how does p, the number of collisions, depend upon the mass of the big ball? Now, what's important here, the only bit that I've had to throw in that I must say Brady wasn't that impressed with when I told him, but still, I think it's neat, is that there's a very particular value for the big ball that we're interested in. The mass of the big ball is 16 times 100 to the power n, and the th times the mass of the little ball. Okay, so if n equals zero, then the big ball is just 16 times the mass of the little ball. If n equals one, then the big ball is 1,600 times the mass of the little ball, and you get the idea. If n equals two, then the big ball is um, one th is 160,000 times the mass of the little ball. So it rapidly, it jumps, up in it jumps up in hundreds, that's right. Not tens. Not tens. Now, in each case, you can ask how many steps, how many collisions of the big ball and the little ball are there before the big ball starts going in the opposite direction. In other words, before the big ball starts going backwards. And the result is remarkable. So the number of steps when n equals zero is equal to three, so the number of collisions is three. The number of collisions when n equals one is 31. And the number of collisions when n equals two is 314, and it goes on. It goes on so that for the case of a general n, the number of collisions is the the first n plus one uh, digits of pi. Pi being 3.141 dot 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 dot. And it's true for any n. So as n goes towards infinity, you just keep recovering the first n plus one digits of pi. It's not, it's not an expansion or anything like that, it's just the expression that you get. And nothing to do with circles. Nothing to do with circles. You can work out this. Um, the key ingredients that you need, which we do at school, is you need to remember that we have conservation of energy in the collision and conservation of momentum. That's all we need to make use of. And when you've got that, you can work out the velocity of the, part of the big ball after n collisions. It's possible to do that, and then the num which I'll call un. Okay, so after n collisions, the big ball velocity is un. And it turns out I can work out what un is. Un, after, after a bit of algebra, un, in terms of this initial velocity, u0, is given by the following. It's given by this fairly simple expression. I'll tell you what x is in a minute, so don't panic, Brady. It's given by... This bit's kind of irrelevant. But the bit that's important is the following. There's a cosine of this angle, theta. So x is just the ratio of the little mass to the big mass. 
So it's generally going to be very small. You can see that the, the, the largest it's going to be is 1 over 16, and then it just gets really, really small very quickly. So x is generally much less than unity. So cos theta is equal to 1 minus x over 1 plus x, okay? So everything is in terms of x, this ratio. So how can I see when this ball is going to start going in the opposite direction? And all I need to do that is to remember what, that's, sorry, that's cos n theta. I missed out an important n there, okay? That's cos of n theta, not cos theta. All I need to do is, is look at this cosine function. And we, we know what the cosine looks like from our school days. Cosine looks like the following. It's got, as a function of some angle alpha, the cosine of alpha looks like this. It goes between 1 and minus 1. So, and it changes when alpha is pi by 2. It goes from positive values to negative values when alpha is pi by 2. That's our smoking gun. There it is, Brady. Pi's are coming in. So when n theta, or alpha, is less than pi by 2, cosine is positive, so un is positive. That means it's going in that direction. But when n theta gets bigger than pi by 2, cos n theta goes negative, so un goes negative, and it's beginning to go in that direction. So when n is 0, it's the integer part of uh, 10 to the 0 times pi, which is just pi, and so the integer part of that is 3. When n is 1, the number of collisions is the integer part of 10 times pi, which is 31. And when n is 2, it's the integer part of uh, 100 times pi, which is 314. And this is true for any value of n. And the light went off. Perfect. <laughs>